Okay, good morning. My name is Skip Conover, and I am the founder of the Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group. And for the last few days, I've been doing a daily lecture for really beginners in Jungian psychology. And I'm going to do another basic lecture today, but it's going to be a little bit more complex in the sense that it takes on uh, the issue of the religions of the world and um, psychology and theology. Now, a caveat uh, to begin with, I am not a theologian. I have taken maybe during my college years more than 50 years ago, I, I've taken a couple of courses in Eastern theological thought, and I'm not a psychologist. I've never taken a course in psychology. Uh, I'm entirely self-taught in Jungian psychology. But I have reason to believe that I know something about it. I've been studying it for 32 years. Um, one time in the spirit of Dr. Jung's dictum that every analyst needs to have an analyst, I decided to try to find a Jungian analyst to work with me. And the answer I got was, I'm afraid of you, quote unquote. And uh, that's quite interesting because um, Dr. Paul Vanderclay, who's uh, a theologian in Sacramento, California, who's made a, quite a number of comments about, um, about uh, Jordan Peterson, uh, also seems to be afraid to talk about Jungian psychology. And today I was re-listening to a Jordan Peterson lecture when he was talking about Jungian psychology, and I was reminded that what he said in his lecture was that he found Dr. Jung's book Ion, which is volume 9, small Roman numeral 2 of the collected works of C.G. Jung, and the subtitle of Ion is Researches into the Phenomenology of the Self. And he said that he found that book terrifying, quote unquote. That's what Jordan Peterson said. And, you know, I understand his concerns somewhat, uh, but at the same time, I see uh, the world in a very desperate state. And I think that more average people need to understand what is really going on. And um, I did have a suggestion from one of my uh, viewers from yesterday, which was that if my regular followers, and I see a couple of them here now, if you would every five or 10 minutes, just put CC for closed captioning colon, and, and then a summary of what we're talking about in the chat that will help others who are joining late. And also it'll help others uh, like people in Korea who may not have English as a first language and so they may have a difficulty uh, following my conversation, but they might be able to read it a little bit better. And so the question is where to begin and um, I guess the answer to that, and this is not really a discussion for BTS armies per se, because I'm not really going to talk about BTS today. I'm going to talk about what Dr. Jung's uh, work is really about. The last 30 years, he was really talking about religion. And why did he talk about religion? Well, uh, like Paul Vanderclay, like Dr. Paul Vanderclay, the Reverend Paul Vanderclay, 
Dr. Jung was the son of a Reformed pastor. He, he was a Swiss Reformed pastor, and Dr. Van der Klaes, Reverend ba Van der Klaes, lineage is Dutch Reformed, but I have every reason to believe that they're similar in many ways. Um, and Susie, no, this is not going to be about Dionysus today. <laughs> this is uh, going to be about uh, Jungian psychology in a simplistic way, um, so that people can follow what this is about. And so, um, and unfortunately, um, even Jordan Peterson obfuscated about it, if he understands it completely at all. I'm not sure that he does, um, because uh, he made his comment on one of his lectures that's online uh, about Jung. He, it was specifically a lecture supposedly about Jung, he said that he found the book Ion terrifying, quote unquote. And I really don't know why he thought that. We've run an advanced uh, seminar on Ion in our group, in our advanced reading group. And it has certain meanings, certainly. And, um, but we need to understand what these things are about because they also relate to how we're being manipulated. And, and that's a concern. Um, and how we're manipulated in society in general. And so anyway, Dr. Jung was the son of a Swiss Reformed pastor. And his father had lost his faith. And that was difficult for Dr. Jung. But on top of that, Dr. Jung had several experiences when he was young that really made him question religion. And so he spent his whole life diving deeply into religion and understanding how religion came up, what it means, and what it's about. And what he ultimately realized is that every religious statement of whatever kind and with respect to whatever religion is a statement of the psyche. It's not a statement of the physical world, the physis. And he says that in paragraph 752 of Answer to Job, which is one of his seminal works. And he said that late in life, but the point is that uh, religion is basically a early form of psychotherapy, if you will. Uh, theologians and psychologists are really in the same business. And when the religions developed up, uh, they developed by people who were trying to help people get through uh, crises in their lives, and um, and they worked very well uh, in many respects, and so they're naturally evolved methods of psychotherapy, and none of them can be thrown out just because some of their uh, facts or the stories in the religions are not physically true because that's not where they operate at all. They work in the psyche, they don't work in the physical world. And so, but this has been a, a huge question of confusion throughout the 20th century. It's still a question of confusion because we have fundamentalists who swear that the Bible is literally true in every word. And it is, <laughs> but so is the Quran, and so is the Bhagavad Gita, and they are true in the psyche. They're not true in the physical world necessarily, except to the extent they're historical uh, stories that have historical events in them. And so I, for example, have no question that there was a... Um, 
a historical Jesus Christ. I'm sure that that was true. Uh, and I have no question that there was a historical Abraham or a historical Job. All of those people actually existed and um, their stories have been passed down and embellished for uh, thousands of years. And um, But let me, uh, let me first of all um, start with why I have uh, this placard on this particular video. And, um, and Dr. Young, late in his life, uh, wrote um, 14 letters to mainly to theologians describing his position on religion. And this was after 60 years of, of thought, really. And these are summarized in this book, uh, The New God Image by Dr. Edward Edinger. Uh, and the subtitle is A Study of Jung's Key Letters Concerning the Evolution of the Western God Image. And what I want to point out, first of all, let me say that all 12, or I'm sorry, all 14 letters I've read into this YouTube channel. So if you want to hear them read to you, all you have to do is go to the front page, uh, the home page of this YouTube channel, and you will find a playlist called uh, Blunt Psychiatrist versus Theologians. And you will hear what Dr. Jung said in all of these letters. But I'm going to refer to specifically to a letter that he wrote to the Reverend David Cox. And he wrote this letter on September 25th, 1957. So when he was 81 years old and four years before he died. And um, I'm just going to summarize one key passage here. Um, his point is that God incarnates in all of us. And, uh, and his point was that when Jesus said that he would send the Holy Ghost, what he meant was that there would be a spirit that would enter everyone. And that's, in fact, what happened uh, and in the Western world, people who had heard the message of Christ. And so he says, if God incarnates in the empirical man, man is confronted with the divine problem. Being and remaining man, he has to find an answer. It is the question of opposites raised at the moment when God was declared to be good only. Where then is the dark side? Christ is the model for the human answers, and his symbol is the cross, the union of the opposites. This will be the fate of man, and this he must understand if he is to survive at all. We are threatened with universal genocide if we cannot work out the way of salvation by a symbolic death. In order to accomplish his task, man is inspired by the Holy Ghost in such a way that he is apt to identify him with his own mind. He even runs the grave risk of believing that he has a messianic mission and forces tyrannous doctrines upon his fellow beings. He would be better to disidentify his mind from the small voice within from dreams and fantasies through which the divine spirit manifests itself. One should listen to the inner voice attentively, intelligently, and critically, because the voice one hears is, uh, let's see what the translation is, is the influxus divinic, divinus consisting, it means the influx of God's ideas, as the acts of John aptly state, of right and left streams of opposites. 
they have to be clearly separated so that their positive and negative as aspects become visible. Only thus can we take up a middle position and discover the middle way. That is the task left to man, and that is the reason why man is so important to God that he decided to become a man himself. I must apologize for the length of this exposition. This is actually a 10 page long letter, but I'm reading only about half a page. Please do not think that I am stating a truth. I am merely trying to present a hypothesis which might explain the bewildering conclusions resulting from the clash of traditional symbols and psychological experiences. I thought it best to put my cards on the table so that you get a clear picture of my ideas. Although all this sounds as if it was a sort of theological speculation, it is in reality modern man's perplexity expressed in symbolic terms. It is the problem I so often had to deal with in treating the neuroses of intelligent patients. It can be expressed in a more scientific, psychological language. For instance, instead of using the term God, you say unconscious. Instead of Christ, self. Instead of incarnation, integration of the unconscious. Instead of salvation or redemption, individuation. Instead of crucifixion or sacrifice on the cross, realization of the four functions or of wholeness. I think it is no disadvantage to religious tradition if we can see how far it coincides with psychological experience. On the contrary, it seems to me a most welcome aid in understanding religious traditions. And so his point is that Nietzsche said that God is dead in Thus Spake that Zarathustra. And Paul van der Klee talks about the problem that uh, Christians have had since uh, Darwin, but it, it actually goes back much farther than that. It goes back to the 16th century and when um, Galileo put his eye to a telescope, he said that the earth is not the center of the universe, that the earth um, orbits the sun instead of vice versa. And because of that heresy, he was hauled up before the Inquisition and had to swear on a stack of Bibles that, or no, on one Bible, I'm sorry, on one Bible, but he knew that he was uh, being recorded for history because he knew the Catholic Church kept good records. And so he had to swear on a Bible that the sun orbits the earth, which he did. That's called the abjuration of Galileo Galilei. And um, he basically made monkeys of the Inquisition for all time. His penalty, because he did that swearing, uh, swearing that the church was right, um, was that he was never allowed to look through a telescope again, which was probably a good thing because everyone says he was blind by then for having looked too much at the sun through a telescope. Um, and But in the four years he had left in his life, he invented two additional sciences, one of which is quantum mechanics which we still haven't finished figuring out <laughs> today. So uh, we haven't achieved the unified field theory between uh, the very small and the very large. That's still a scientific conundrum. But here I'm talking about the religious conundrum. And the fundamental issue with Paul van der Klee and with Jordan Peterson is they are entirely focused on the logos, okay? Because the book of John begins with uh, the statement, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And so 
everything that I say and everything that's in any book you ever read, those are all words and those are all part of the Logos. I mean, even these words here are part of the Logos. And the question is, what gets through to you in life? Because the logo, in the Logos, there is no life. This book, this, this book is just a doorstop unless you put life into it. Okay, otherwise it's just a black book with a lot of words in it and it has no meaning whatsoever unless you put life into it. And, and that's true of everything. Okay, everything in this room, we need logos. There's no doubt about it. Everything that you can see in the image right now and everything that you can see in your room with the exception of potted plants, perhaps, uh, and your children, maybe, uh, but everything else is uh, the result of logos. And we need logos because every product needs to be produced 100% perfectly. Um, Boeing aircraft uh, created an airplane, the 737 MAX 9 and MAX 10, that is not perfect. And we see what the results are with that. Now, there are airlines all over the world that have airplanes they can't use until those airplanes are made perfect again. So everything that we have in life uh, has to be perfect, um, every physical thing. But the physical things have no life in them. It's only when we bring our lives to them and use them for something. So one of my favorite um, things, which I everybody has probably seen this, a couple of times. Um, one of my favorite images is this image. And this is a um, this is a 63 foot motor yacht. And it's aptly named because it's called Never Enough. And the point is that uh, in American society, many of us are trying to get things, okay? We're after things. But when we get them, typically they don't satisfy us. So you see that uh, this owner realizes this. He, he called his boat never enough because once he achieved getting his boat, um, he realized that he wants a bigger boat. <laughs> it's never enough. And, um, and so if, if you put your God into material things, you're going to be dissatisfied in the end. I mean, this, this boat would be wonderful if it was filled with people who were out on the Chesapeake Bay or the sea, um, enjoying it, but the, it isn't. And if you go to any seaside city in the United States today, you'll find the marinas filled with fiberglass. And, uh, you know, on weekends they have life in them, but otherwise, no. And so uh, the problem that I see with what Jordan Peterson and Dr. Vanderclay uh, through his Christian teaching has done is they put everything on the logo side and they haven't given room for life itself. And, um, you know, it's a false, we have false sets of opposites when we say that everything has to be either masculine or feminine. Okay, that's just a way of politically keeping women down because Dr. Peterson put logos against chaos and the paternal against the maternal. And once you do that, then you're saying that the maternal, the feminine is chaos. And that's not true at all. Okay. We, we all depend on uh, the women in our lives. Indeed, women are the only human creatures that can create life. 
and uh, that's far more than chaos. That's a very organized uh, activity that has developed evolutionarily for 3.5 million years. It's not chaos at all. We are not created by chaos. We are created by reproduction. And not only that, we're created by reproduction that has worked perfectly for every one of us for the last three and a half billion years. Because if we go back far enough, we'll find ancestors who were single-celled organisms. And since then, since the invention of sex, we're all descended from a female. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, and so that's not chaos. That's the development of the human species over many years. Okay. So, what does Doctor Jung mean? Well, let, let me just go back to the argument first about uh, Doctor Vanderclay and Doctor Peterson. Dr. Vanderclay, whenever you hear him talk about theology, he will go into a hundred excuses that he studied in divinity school, etc. But they're all based on um, Aquinas' writing or somebody else's writing, whatever it is. And it will, but it will always be looking back toward a book. Uh, and so, Yes, we need books. Science or, you know, civilized life was created because we were able to discern and work out how to do things in the world. That's how we have civilization today. Uh, I'll just read a short passage from Esther Harding's book, um, Psychic Energy, Its Sources and Transformation. And this is the first paragraph in her book, which is beneath the decent facade of consciousness with its disciplined moral order and its good intentions lurk the crude and instinctive forces of life, like monsters of the deep, devouring, begetting, warring endlessly. They are for the most part unseen, yet on their urge and energy, life itself depends. Without them, living beings would be as inert as stones. But were they left to function unchecked, life would lose its meaning, being reduced once more to mere birth and death, as in the teeming world of the primordial swamps. In creating civilization, man sought, however unconsciously, to curb these natural forces and to channel some part at least, of their energy into forms that would serve a different purpose. For with the coming of consciousness, cultural and psychological values began to compete with the purely biological aims of unconscious functioning. So what I'd like to do now is just read for you um, Dr. Jung's definition of God. Because from my point of view, Nietzsche said God is dead. Dr. Jung found the living God, found where the living God lives, and found how the living God goes about doing the work of the Godhead. And so Dr. Jung's definition of God is as follows. God is the name by which I designate all things which cross my willful path violently and recklessly, all things which upset my subjective views, plans, and intentions, and change the course of my life for better or worse. Okay, so I had an experience with that God this morning. I intended to get started at 10 o'clock this morning, uh, but I got a little bit behind the eight ball because I went to the gym first. And then when I came back, I could not find my copy of Ion. Go figure. It's the one of the most important books I own, and yet I can't find it in my office. So I need to clean up my room as Dr. Uh, as Dr. Peterson suggests. Um, but 
both Dr. Peterson and the Reverend Paul Vanderclay rely on the logos and rely on the word, but those are not life. And what we have to understand is that, okay, our science has found there's no God up there. Okay, we can see back to the Big Bang. There's no God up there. There's no heaven up there. And there's no Satan down below. There, there's certainly a fire, but no Satan. Um, but God, come, God and Satan are, come from us, and they come from the unconscious. And so if you think about that then, um, Dr. Jung at one point had an experience with a, an analysis who called across the street to him one time and said he had a dream about falling off of a mountain. And Dr. Jung said, well, you better not go mountain climbing. And what he meant by that was that there was a, a, a compensation going on in that man's psyche, which was trying to tell him that he was pushing it, okay, that he was doing things that he shouldn't do in his mountain climbing, and his dream was trying to warn him about that. But nonetheless, three months later, this fellow uh, stepped off a mountain and, um, and died. And so, <clears throat> so our unconscious tells us things all the time. Uh, and, you know, I had an accident like that on, on January the 4th, 1990, um, in my Marine Corps uniform, um, I fell down and broke my leg. And that, in terms of this definition of God, that was uh, God telling me, um, your Marine Corps career is over. In fact, that was the last thing I did in uniform. And so, uh, other than uh, I occasionally, nowadays, because I have the privilege of being a retired officer, I occasionally do a, a um, honor salute for veterans who are dying at our local hospice. Um, but other than those, uh, the only reason I, I don't wear my uniform anymore, because I'm no longer on active duty and haven't been since 1990, and, um, but that was this unconscious God telling me that, you know, I'm wasting my time uh, trying to be a Marine. Now, self is something else. Let's go to this idea of self. And I think I still have, let, I hope, um, Dr. Edinger's definition or image of, um, okay, I do have it. All right, so this is Dr. Edward Edinger's uh, diagram of the psyche. And in this diagram, we have our conscious minds, which are our egos. And so at the top of this, you see three egos. One's a woman's ego, a man's ego, and a, a neutral. Uh, sexually neutral ego and beneath that ego is a is the shadow okay because dr jung recognized that the paradoxical god has both good and evil and part of the problem that we have now is that christianity developed over 2000 years denying the existence of evil and um, and we can't, after the 20th century, we cannot deny the existence of evil um, because 175 million people died in warfare in the 20th century and in very horrific ways. And Dr. Peterson, to his credit, has pointed out that both the left and the right when taken to the extreme, 
uh, result in barbaric behavior, okay? And we saw that very definitely in, um, in Nazi Germany and in communist Russia. And so the Nazis were the right and the communists were the left, let's say. But they went, both went to extremes and they both went to barbarity. And